Welcome to Because the Beatles, the podcast about the Beatles, everything about the Beatles 24-8. I'm Allison. And I'm Erica. And before we start, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts or stream us on Spotify. And if you're enjoying BC the Beatles, feel free to leave us a preferably five-star review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We'll be posting videos, photos, and more from this episode and beyond. And you can always email us at BC the Beatles at gmail.com and uh yeah that's the good stuff how are you erica i'm doing all right here in new york for john lennon's 80th birthday oh my gosh i know it's crazy and we're gonna get into that we have a really cool show coming up today uh all about john in new york but i wanted to mention if you don't follow us on socials or if you missed our posts um we are starting a monthly giveaway and we sort of yeah, we sort of talked about it on past uh, episodes, and it was a whole thing of, like, leave us a review or rating and email us and blah, blah, blah. It was but complicated. It, super complicated. Like, nobody's going to do that. I wouldn't do it. Um, I'm lazy. So we uh, put a page up on our website, so bcthebeatles.com. Go there. There's a link on the uh, left-hand side uh, in our little menu. It says monthly giveaway. Just click it. And there we have, like, a form where you could – enter our giveaway using gosh you could follow us on twitter and that'll get you entries you can go to our facebook page it'll get you entries it's kind of fun it's like a game i always like those so um go there give us and by the way you don't do any of that you can just give us your email and uh you know enter and we've got tons of cool stuff i took a photo of some of the stuff i have in my apartment i put it up there so um, this month's giveaway for October is a signed copy of the volume two of uh, Ken Womack's George uh, Martin biography signed and um, a pen from Strawberry Field because I bought a bunch of crap from them to help support them <laughs> through this crazy time. And so, yeah, you get a pen from Strawberry Field. Yeah, it comes from Liverpool. Um, so, yeah, that's this month's loot. Go to our website. Follow us everywhere. BC the Beatles. Hell yeah. So going to get into John stuff, but we have to mention that if you're listening to this in real time, um, we are going to be doing some live, live-ish, I guess, Zoom <laughs> stuff with Abby Run River and their JL80 celebration this weekend. They have a whole weekend celebration. It's all free. And if you go to AROTR.com starting tomorrow, there's there's so many fun things. There's going to be panels. There's going to be um, concerts. There's going to be uh, concerts from years past that were hits. There's yeah. Be a lot of things. There's going to be, I think, tomorrow, which is John. Well, it'll be today that you guys are hearing this on John's actual birthday. Um, I think it's today or tomorrow, Saturday, that one of my, uh, like, gosh, I first saw him play when I was like 14, Tim Piper. He was a great John Lennon his concert's going to be on at some point. Um, and they're doing a candlelight vigil for John. Um, there's going to be a pumpkin carving contest, which I'm like going to try to enter. <laughs> awesome. We'll see if I try and carve John's face. I thought about it. I exactly. bought, I actually bought from Amazon, like a proper pumpkin carving set. Um, in like preparation, a one like a, a, a motorized one. No, no, no. Oh, just, you go old school. Just, oh yeah, of course. You got to scoop that shit. And you got to like, yeah, you got to do it by hand, my friend. Wow, motorized I pumpkin carving. Yeah, you get the little knife and it goes like like a little tiny like electric saw and it saws right through it, so you're not chopping your fingers off. Wow. Nope. I mean, well, I think a couple of years ago we tried to carve pumpkins and we just got like. You know the, the crap you get from the store that comes like a book of patterns or something and then mm-hmm. they break off and it's just like a mess. So I had those, but then I'm like, oh, you know, invest in a little something better so I can carve John. So we'll see if I actually do it. I might not, but we'll see. I hope you do it. <laughs> see. Look <laughs> how motivated I am if I can make it out to get a pumpkin. <laughs> That's step one. Yes, exactly. So check out uh, the schedule, as Erica said. Um, you can also find them on Facebook, which is where a lot of the live videos and things will be going up throughout the day. Um, and then Erica is going to do something pretty cool. Yes, I am. I have recently moved to the Upper West Side of New York City. So I am very, very close to Strawberry Fields and the Dakota. So tomorrow or 
I guess today, the day that we are posting this episode, I'll be going down to the Imagine Mosaic to do some Instagram Live or some Facebook Live of whatever's going on over there. Unfortunately, with COVID, this is the first year that all the official celebrations are online. But I will guess that there's going to be a pretty strong grassroots uprising over there. Not uprising, but, you know, movement to celebrate John's birthday. Yeah, definitely. And we'll be putting uh, some of that probably on our Instagram as well. So, um, yeah, just keep an eye out for that. I'm excited to see what's going to go go on tomorrow at Strawberry Field. I know. Yeah. And make sure you look up. I mean, I'm not sure if Yoko's at the Dakota. I sort of thought that they were not in New York City right now. But, you know, she always lights a candle. Or is that for December 8th? I feel like it's... Uh, I thought it was for December 8th, but maybe she does it for both. I don't know. Yeah. I I don't know. But this seems like as good a year as any to light an extra candle if you're going to do it. Totally. Well, report back. Yeah. I will. Cool. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about John. <laughs> we talk. So we talk a lot about Paul in this podcast, but, you know, yeah. we love John. And John is actually, you know, Brian is my favorite Beatle, but John is my favorite actual Beatle. <laughs> And, um, you know, going into his birthday, I've, it's been really nice because I've kind of revisited John in a lot of ways. And um, I, you know, listening to Sean's interviews with Elton John and Julian and Paul on BBC Two last weekend, um, if you haven't heard it, it's amazing. You just search it, Google it, and you'll find it. Um, And it really like, got me a little emotional because John was a huge part of my early Beatles fandom Um, Mm. because he you know was my favorite and uh, I loved him and got super into him and his music and all of that and I sort of like not abandoned it but I kind of moved away as I've gotten older and then going back and listening to his entire discography which I did this past week which given it's not that extensive but um just going through album by album album and like all these memories resurfacing it's it's really profound you know um you know thinking about john his life and we were talking a little bit earlier um but thinking about how it's also not only his 80th birthday this year but it's also the 40th anniversary of his murder and you know him being 40 when he was murdered i think we both can relate to you know when you're young it's like oh you know 40 like oh he you know was kind of old and his life was you know he was, he was like middle age at that point mm-hmm. you know but as we're both you know kind of in that realm like you know I'm mm-hmm. in my 30s now and to me it sort of seems like oh my god he was a baby he was yeah. a baby like 40 is not old guys I mean I know we have young youngsters to quote Ed Sullivan listening <laughs> we have younger people 40 is not old like honestly it's not. like yeah it's not it's 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 so tragic it's even more heartbreaking when you think about how young he was and it's incredible to think about what he's what he did in those 40 years oh my god totally it makes me feel super unaccomplished i know <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's like how many more years do i have like to to live up to like john lennon standards that's called belatedness. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember an English professor in grad school told me about this once, and he was like, you know, belatedness is like, I think about, you know, I'm older than Shakespeare and I've done so much less. I'm like, oh, I know what that means now. I've never heard the term. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, I look at all, like, you can look at the Beatles or whatever, like, all these, like, 20 year olds in the 60s who are writing these insane songs. I'm like, oh, that's great. Good for them. I never would have thought that they were 20 when I was, like, 15. Like, the, the, looking at them, they're almost ageless. It's weird. It is weird. I still see them as older than me. Yeah, like, I, I do too. Their pictures. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sometimes I'll see a picture of, like, I don't know, somebody from the 60s, like whether it's like Paul sometimes or like uh, I'm thinking about like the monkeys, like Davy Jones or something. And I do. And I am like, oh, my gosh, they they look like a baby. And for that moment, it's like, OK, yeah, they're like 22 or something. Mm-hmm. But 
yeah, I still look at like Michael Nesmith and I'm like, oh, he's older than me. Even though in the photo, he's like 24. Yeah. You know? He's got that look. Yeah. He was, al- he's always older than you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. He- <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. I feel like John's that way too. It's like John always looks older than. Uh, yeah. And he was so creative and his mind was so different that it's yeah. like, you know, it, it was, I think, as hard as a child to think about being the same age as him because he was just unique yeah i mean john like he packed so much into those 40 years he really lived an accelerated life i think because i don't know i mean like not to get too crazy but i definitely and this sort of was brought to the surface a little bit when i listened to sean talk um uh on the the radio program because You know, it's like John, of course, lost his mother when he was very young. He was, you know, in his teens and, uh, you know, she was taken away very suddenly. And I was thinking about Sean and Sean being five and his father being taken away very suddenly. And I thought about myself because I was Mm -hmm. seven when my dad died of cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, my mom died five years ago very suddenly. And it's like I could hear it in Sean's voice as he's talking to these people who knew his dad, even Julian, and sort of saying like, do you remember this? Like, what did my dad think of this? Do you remember what he said about this? Like, did you talk to him about this? And it's like, it really like, it got me in a way because I do the same thing. I think about that all the time where it's like, you're just trying to like unearth these facts about your parents. Cause you didn't know, you know, a certain thing about them. And it's harder for Sean, I'm sure, because it's like, you know, his dad has been built into this legend and it's like, how can you separate the man from the myth? You know? And it's like, Sean, the way he talks about his dad and the way he talks about the music, it's like, he even calls himself a fan and he's like, Oh, I read this thing about this song, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but you know, he just wants to get to know the man yeah. and it's so hard. And it really struck me. Um, and maybe this because I'm getting older, but I have a lot more compassion for John too. You know, having dealt with a lot of stuff in his early years, you know, going through a lot of fears of abandonment and a lot of trauma. And the break of the Beatles is obviously super traumatic. I don't know. This year for his birthday, I guess it's appropriate, his 80th birthday, a big birthday. It's like, I just, I've been having all these John feels and I feel like they're, he's just so much more in perspective for me now. It's, it's very weird. It's been very profound this year. And, you know, I'm sure it'll be that in December too, you know, when it comes about 40 years and it's weird to think that starting, you know, next year, it'll be like more time that he's been gone than he was alive. That's very strange. That's, that's crazy. I mean, John is just so, larger than life i mean our first episode about john was sinner versus saint because there's this dichotomy of these two extremes yeah so you know it takes i think a little mental effort to really think about john but once you start thinking about who john was as a person and all of what he crammed into these 40 years and how he lived his life you know so raw and open it's it's a lot to really think about yeah, I mean, we could do so many, I, you know, I even started thinking about like the primal screen therapy and all of that. And it's like, it makes a lot of sense. And when I was a kid, it made no sense. Like all of this stuff. I'm like, I don't understand anything about John's life. Like he is such, he was such a weirdo. He did all this weird stuff. I love him. He's my favorite Beatle, but I don't understand any of it. And now I'm sort of like, I realize the complexities of like, the 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 reason of the primal scream you know right that that uh, expressing what that which is unexpressible you know and i have so much more respect for that and he's just a person who sort of ages with you i think maybe you know i i'm curious to know about other people's perception of that because i i definitely find that's true yeah i think so too i i don't think that as a younger person i was able to access enough experience and an, enough maybe even trauma to understand what it was that he was talking about and thinking about and why he would write songs like that yeah but you know the more the more shit you experience I think the more you can relate yeah totally totally so just yeah definitely having a Lennon moment and which is you know it's it's uh I feel hashtag blessed 
to be doing it around <laughs> John's birthday. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah, exactly. By the way, I got to mention happy 45th to Sean. They have the same birthday. Oh, yes. yes. Happy 45th, Sean. Man, <laughs> that is insane. Sean is kicking ass and taking names in his own musical life. He sure is. And that that interview you're talking about, how he was asking people about it, I thought the the most, the sweetest part was when he was talking to Paul and he was like, you knew my grandmother. Like, you actually knew oh her. God, like, what I was know. she like? We're always reading about these people and we're talking about them and Julia and she, you know, she looms large in the legend. And, um, but, you know, she was actually this man's grandmother and he yeah. never met her. And he's asking his dad's old friend what his grandmother was like oh my god i know i mean just on a human level those interviews ripped me apart like and it's not even like don't think if you haven't listened to them yet guys like definitely listen to them it's not gonna like kill you like this isn't super emotional but i think just yeah like exactly what you're talking about erica it's like to us like julia is stuff of legend and then we've i think we've all lost a grandparent i think we've all lost our parents Mm -hmm. like what was my grandpa like for sean he just wants to hear about his grandma because he has heard about her and you know what do you remember about her paul i really hope that he has had some good like offline conversations about these people because i don't think paul really offered up much that we don't even know like i sort of was like okay we all know like that about julia but i and i really hope and i know that sean alluded to the fact that he and julian had some really good conversations themselves which is wonderful, but I really, really hope that in private, he's having a lot of lovely conversations about his dad and his, his grandmother. I would guess he is. I mean, and even though we all know the story, I, I feel like hearing it from somebody who was there yeah, might yeah. make him feel like it's more real than reading about it in a book or on a website. Totally, totally. And I'm guessing that Sean met Mimi because Mimi outlived John into the 80s. So... I'm sure Mimi oh, had some good stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she has a certain perspective. Though. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we would have definitely had Mimi on the podcast. Oh, hell yeah. She would have spilled some tea and that would have been great. I feel like she'd be like Maggie Smith and Downton Abbey, though. Oh, what my God. Podcast. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, totally. To- she's like the uh, the dowager. Is that the dowager countess? Yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. Good old Mimi. Well, speaking of Mimi, let's talk about John. Yeah. Let's talk about John and where he went after he was in England for a lot of his life. We decided that since it's his birthday and since Allison and I are both current and or past New York City residents, that we would focus a little bit on John's time in New York City for his birthday. Yoko once said that New York City never changed John Lennon. He was born a New Yorker. He loved this place. So we wanted to talk about the time that he spent in the city he loved and where he made his final home. How long did you live in New York? I lived in New York for seven years. Yeah, I moved there right after college, went to grad school for two years, NYU, and then suffered through New York for five years. And I still consider it my home. It kicked my ass, which it does, and I love it so much. I do consider myself a New Yorker, so I can relate. I think you are born a New Yorker. Some people mm-hmm. don't have the stuff it takes to like live in that city. It's hard, Erica, yeah. you know. Oh, I know. I went to college here. I lived here after college, came back a number of years ago, and I just moved to Manhattan. Which I'm supremely jealous of. It's a very, very small place. Who cares? You live on the Upper West <laughs> Side. It's freaking awesome. I'm in John's neighborhood now, but I think, yeah, it's it's not a question of if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. I think you either love it or you hate it. Like yeah. There's there's not much of a middle ground for New York, and John and Yoko loved it. Yeah. Well, Yoko was a native, pretty much. She went to Sarah Lawrence for college. Yeah, she was here before this in the 60s. She was, and in the 50s, she was doing experimental arts. So she already was really in tune with that scene already. John and Yoko moved back to New York City, back to Yoko, first time for John in 1971. And uh, that was a pretty heavy time of transformation and transition for John. 
he was leaving the Beatles behind after lots of acrimony, lots of disappointment. There was the legal battle. There was the interpersonal battle. John and Yoko went one way. Paul and Linda went a very different way. And, you know, maybe it was that a move to another continent was the best way that he felt he could truly break away from the confines of life as a Beatle. He was feeling hemmed in in England, both physically and artistically. In fact, he said about moving, I just couldn't live there anymore. I couldn't handle the hounding by the media and the public who always wanted more, more, more. That doesn't sound much different to me than what they felt after they stopped touring, that they just couldn't take it anymore. I mean, I, it would be hard, especially after going through such a public divorce with the Beatles. There was no chance of John ever being anonymous again because everybody wanted to know what was going on. Oh, sure. And the, the English press hated Yoko. They were oh, incredibly yeah. cruel to her. And they piled all the blame on her totally unfairly for breaking up the Beatles, which a lot of people still do, which they should not do. No. Please don't do that. Don't. Don't do it. If you do it on our our socials, you get banned. Just FYI. You do. (laughs) (laughs) And not to mention he was recently busted for pot in the UK, so he was feeling the heat there. It's just a very, like, claustrophobic, not great. You know, he wanted to be more experimental artistically. He was not feeling any of that in England. So it was at Yoko's urging that they realized this dream of moving to New York. He would live there the last 10 years of his life. And in fact, he never returned to England after that. That's so crazy. But you know what? The one thing about New York, I got to give John a shout out because he's, I bet he realized this and this was a main reason to, for moving there. It's like New Yorkers do not give a fuck. Like they don't give a shit. Like I've, you know, walked past so many celebrities on the street and like nobody, everybody sort of like sees them and like, Oh, like it's Paul Giamatti and then like they do not care. So it's like if John was going to be semi-anonymous anywhere, it's going to be New York. For sure. He got the chance to live more of that anonymous life. He got the chance to do things like ride city buses. Um, he and May Pang would actually tour the city that way. They would ride buses until somebody noticed him and then they would hop off and try another one. But what John said was it was Yoko who sold me on New York as she made me walk around the streets and parks and squares to examine every nook and cranny. Hmm. In fact, you could say I fell in love with New York on a street corner. I love that because it's so relatable. <laughs> I know. I mean, if you love New York, that's what that's where you fall in love. That's why you're here. Yeah. I mean, one of the weird things I miss, and it's it speaks to that, like where you do, you fall in love with like stupid stuff. But the one thing I miss is the smell of Greenwich Village when it rained. <laughs> and it smells like disgustingness mixed with like, <laughs> you know, the street and garbage and all that. But I just, ah, I love that smell. And I weirdly sometimes love the subway smell too. I do too. Yeah. It's just like those weird little things that you can't even put your finger on. And you, like you say, you either love it or you hate it. So it's like, yeah, if you see something cool on a street corner, I could totally see John on like a street corner in the East Village uh, with like some cool art on a lamppost being like, okay, yeah, that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. I love this place. Well, it's so weird and quirky. I mean, there's, there's so much to discover. Oh yeah, totally. And I'm I'm sure he just loved the opportunity to be able to physically walk around and see it all. Yeah. Mostly anonymous. Totally. I mean, keep in mind, like how many times had he been to New York as a Beatle? A few, not a lot, but a few. And how much did he see? Um, not a lot. <laughs> Nothing. He saw hotels and planes and a trains and concerts. Yes. yes just exactly. like, just like granddad said in a hard day's night. Yes. Couldn't have said it better than Mr. Bramble. <laughs> so John and Yoko started with a two month stay at the St. Regis hotel. Now the St. Regis is as luxurious and old New York as you can get. It's up there with the Algonquin. It's huge. It's on Fifth Avenue. Marilyn Monroe stayed there. Ernest Hemingway stayed there. They invented the Bloody Mary, for fuck's sake. At at St. Regis? At the St. Regis? Yes, they, was, they invented the Bloody Mary at the St. Regis. Holy shit. It's an institution. Also, it's one block away from Trump Tower. I would expect that if John was alive today, he wouldn't be so keen on living that close to it. But he may have been heartened by the constant protests in front of it and the gigantic yellow Black Lives Matter mural that 
was painted just steps away. Maybe he would have even participated in the painting. It would have been interesting had he still been living at the St. Regis. Yeah. Well, the most notable event during those two months was the demo recording of what eventually became Happy Xmas War is Over. They also did a number of interviews from there, and I found one that was especially bitter and incendiary towards basically everybody in his life at the time. Maybe we'll post that on our socials because it really is a hoot. He, it's a he, lot. It's definitely like his burn book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But they didn't stay there for very long. They loved being in the city, but they felt that the location and the -the over-the-top luxury at the St. Regis, well, they couldn't, they couldn't be anonymous. You know, you can't be anonymous when the, when the doorman is announcing every guest who comes to see you. So eventually they moved to basically the opposite place. They moved to Greenwich Village in a two-room apartment and the address was 105 Bank Street. Well, I got very excited and I forgot about this until we started, you know, doing this episode um, because I am a massive Love and Spoonful fan. My favorite artist, single artist ever is John Sebastian and uh, love him so much. He was actually born in Bang Street in Greenwich Village. Yeah. But what I thought was cool and again, forgot about this totally, but the building in which John and Yoko uh, lived in their apartment was owned by Joe Butler, who was the drummer of Love and Spoonful. And he was also living in Bing Street at the time. So, and I, yeah, I thought that was very cool. That is very cool. Yeah. So he and John and Yoko and many other people who visited them, lots of the revolutionaries, Allen Ginsberg, you know, lots of famous, famous counterculture luminaries would visit them and they could have these guests and walk around the streets of Greenwich Village pretty undisturbed and anonymous. This apartment was small. It was two rooms. It was, I found a picture of a great picture. Did you see this picture that I sent? It was on the, oh, oh, we'll put it, we'll put yeah. it in the slideshow. It was a picture of John and Yoko just sitting on their bed in their extremely small, extremely cramped apartment watching TV and playing the guitar. I'm like, oh my God, John and Yoko are like every other New Yorker in their tiny, tiny apartments. Yeah, it reminds me of those photos of like Bob Dylan and Susie Rodolo in their apartment on uh, West 4th Street. And Mm -hmm. it's just like them literally on a mattress. Bob's playing a a guitar. Like Susie's just sitting there. He's got his head in her lap. It's like, looks like every like poor college kid you've ever seen with their first apartment. And I mean, there's something refreshing about that, though, like a total renewal of like a clean slate. And I'm sure Johnny Yoko totally felt that. Yeah, especially after how hounded they were and the pressures of Beatlemania and what the, you know, the lawyers and the press to just be able to kind of like chill out in your apartment and run to the bodega for, you know, a beer or whatever and come home and not be bothered. That was probably a dream for him. Heaven. Yeah. So he did become a little bit more anonymous, but even though he had a little bit more personal anonymity, his association with people like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and Andy Warhol, they uh, gave him a little more notoriety with the U.S. government. Um, Mm -hmm. He became much more vocal in anti-Vietnam war rallies and, of course, his concerts, protest events, the Happy Christmas War is Over signs, the John Sinclair song, you name it, he did it. It got him on a secret list of uh, the FBI and the Nixon administration, and that precipitated a five-year battle against extradition that was clearly a source of tension in John's life, and even in his music. Uh, It caused a lot of trouble for him. God, can you even imagine? Like, that's thinking about that in the context of today's politics it's like wow they really had nothing better to do than focus on john fucking lennon <laughs> getting him out I of know. the country i know nixon was so paranoid that's true well <laughs> i mean his his dea officer was friggin elvis for a while and then uh you know i mean this is coming <laughs> after of course the red scare in the 50s and all of that and communists blah 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 so i guess it makes sense at least it was something that happened. Our conspiracy theories are what, QAnon now? Oh, Jesus. I wonder if John would have thought of QAnon. I hope he would have laughed at it. Because it's yeah, ridiculous. That's what it's good for. Yeah. <laughs> it's being like, LOL, that's dumb. Yeah, yeah. There's babies in Wayfair furniture. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
I know. I want to order the Ashley cabinet for $60,000. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. John. <laughs> In New York. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the government was already suspicious of him. They'd heard about the pot bust in the UK right before he moved to New York, but this, you know, all of this protest stuff and who he was hanging with really made him a target. Um, Immigration and Naturalization Service ordered his deportation based on alleged communist ties. The FBI head, famous J. Edgar Hoover, ordered the New York office to promptly initiate discreet efforts to locate the subject. Wow. But this is funny. <laughs> the FBI somehow listed his address as the St. Regis Hotel on 150 Bank Street. Oh, so okay. So confused FBI agents were wandering this Greenwich Village back street looking for this upscale hotel that they could never find. It was a mystery to them. Could what not the figure hell? it out. <laughs> uh, okay. Like, there's a lot. Like... Okay, you're New York cops and you don't. That doesn't like ring any bells for you being like, oh, that sounds like it's not right. I love the the idea of them hunting for this hotel. It's like, um, if you have even like visited New York a number of times, you know where the St. Regis is, you know? It's like some Harry Potter shit. It's gonna like materialize between two buildings like twelve or Oh my god. Totally. (laughs) It is. And you're gonna get some butter beer and it's gonna be great. Mm, I love me some butter beer. Me too want it anyway <laughs> but um, lucky for john and yoko they never found them <laughs> wow i can't believe it <laughs> yeah so they hid out in their their little apartment uh, until about 1973 the area was pretty crime ridden at the time it's not the upscale greenwich village that we know today and uh they got robbed and so they decided to move somewhere with just a little more security Makes and sense. that they did And the place that they moved ended up being the uh, building and the neighborhood that ended up synonymous with John in New York City, which is the Dakota building on West 72nd Street. Beautiful building. It is. so gorgeous. Now, the Dakota was built in 1885, and it got its name because at the time, this gigantic fortress-like building, entire city block, was so far uptown, they said it might as well have been in the Dakota territories. <laughs> Consider- I mean, the subway goes up to like 200th Street now, so New York City's grown just a little since then. That's so funny. I know. The building has a long history of being home to famous people like Judy Garland, Lauren McCall, Leonard Bernstein, but there wasn't 100% certainty that John and Yoko would be accepted into this Uh, this apartment they were had a pretty stuffy and a hard-ass board of residents and uh, they weren't entirely happy about john and yoko's reputation and john wasn't apparent was apparently not very happy when yoko decided she wanted to go to their initial interview wearing a pair of floral hot pants as one does i mean who hasn't worn a pair of floral hot pants to an interview come on Hmm. john made a change Uh, the rest of the street (laughs) and they got accepted in the apartment but it wasn't a given i mean in the future such people who we we would think that are john and yoko's contemporaries like billy joel carly simon and gene simmons were rejected from residency in the dakota okay like gene simmons are all right fine billy joel like mr new york state of mind he could. He didn't get accepted to the Dakota. Like what the? It was fuck? a raging alcoholic. Might have been. Oh, uh, that. Yeah. There you go. Carly Simon. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know why Carly raging. Simon would be a problem. Yeah. Like okay. I mean, it, unless she was still married to James Taylor. Who? Yeah. Maybe they were in their heroin phase. At the exactly. Time. Yeah. That's the only thing I could think of. Uh, <laughs> interesting. This. I wonder who's on this co-op board. <laughs> I don't know. They seem pretty. Uh, pretty hardcore. Totally. They got in. Everything was good. And um, other than the exception of the time that John lived with May Pang during his 16th month lost weekend, this was really John's last and most permanent home in New York. Before they moved in, though, Yoko had to do one thing. She insisted they have a seance to make sure there were no evil spirits in the space before they moved in. I, like, fair, though. I mean, it's an old freaking building. And True. with all those famous people, I'm sure the ground had stuff going on, like... I can 
support that, Yoko. I do feel a little creepy walking by the Dakota sometimes, but I think that's for different reasons. It has a lot of vibes about it. I mean, yeah, like not even, it's totally separate from like John's murder, maybe, but it is very ominous looking. And it is. It yeah. was also the, um, I think it was, it was, it was in Rosemary's Baby. Oh, yeah. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> it was in Rosemary's Baby. Like, I mean, it is pretty, I mean, it's definitely haunted. No doubt about it. Like, I don't know what you believe about John. It, I don't really, totally aside from John, it's, it's fucking haunted. Well, I was there a few weeks ago. I was walking around down there and there was a dog and I was petting the dog and I ended up just sort of petting the dog with the guy who owned the dog and the doorman of the Dakota. Mm -hmm. And like, we were just petting the dog. And then I just kind of looked up and like looked in and I was like, oh, I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> like it just weird, weirded me out. I've never been able to like stop in that doorway. Like I've walked past it. Like, God, I don't even know how many times, but it just, I've never been able to like make eye contact with the spot where John was shot. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think what it was like, I was so focused on the dog. I didn't realize exactly like what I was looking at. And then I looked up and I was like, ah, yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just a very foreboding building. And mm -hmm. it's cool because it, that's very New York about it. Like, there's a lot of that in New York. Like, the vibes of New York City are, are legendary for that kind of stuff. But the Dakota is so, like, it and, like, the plaza, I think, are, like, emblematic of these, like, yeah, very fortress-like, big, larger-than-life buildings that just have crazy vibes. Yeah. I'll be going there tomorrow, though, in case there's anything happening in front. Yes. Oh my God. Bring like an Ouija board or something. I mean, Oh God. <laughs> can you imagine? I, I'm so curious if it, it would cause like total outrage in Strawberry Field if there was an Ouija board. <laughs> Maybe there will be one there. Maybe. I mean, this is the unofficial stuff because everything official is online for COVID this year. So you don't know. That's true. I am sickly obsessed with ghost hunting. So that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> totally, totally down. Nice. Um, and speaking of, well, I guess kind of speaking of evil spirits, I think one of the coolest things about John in New York is he claimed he saw a UFO. Yeah, he New did. York. And he was pretty obsessed with the fact that he saw a UFO or thought he did. <laughs> um, he referenced it in one of my favorite John songs, Nobody Told Me, um, which was released posthumously on Milk and Honey um, in the line. There's U UFOs over New York and I ain't too surprised. Me either, John. I'm not. I'm not surprised either. Um, so the story goes is, uh, as Erica just referenced, the period of time when John was not living at the Dakota. He was living with Mate Pang on an apartment in the uh, Upper East Side on East 52nd Street. And in, it was in August 1974. It's a whole other world, really. I mean, in fact, they were living in an apartment uh, right along the East River. Totally different from life in the Dakota, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. He later told the the official UFO story to Andy Warhol's interview magazine. And here's what he said. He said, I was lay lying uh, naked on my bed. Great. Uh, already off to a smashing start, John. I can already picture it. Thanks uh, yep. to virgins. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, yep. And that's in my head. I had the surge. So I went to the window, just dreaming around in my usual poetic frame of mind. Humble, John, humble. Naked. Naked. There, as I turned my head, hovering over the next building no more than 100 feet away, was this thing with ordinary electric light bulbs flashing on and off around the bottom, one non-blinking red light on top. And yeah. he did swear that he was not on drugs at the time. So there's that. And then Mei Pang also wrote about it in her book, uh, her memoir, Loving John, which was published in 1983. She said, you know, John called over the window, was like, Mei Pang, like, look at this. And uh, I'm sure he said that. Just I like hope that. he called her May Pang. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he said it like that. Like Robert California in the Oh US. my God, totally. Robert California. <laughs> um, he is the fucking lizard king, though. Robert California. Oh, God. Anyway, uh, so uh, May wrote, My eye caught this large circular object coming towards us. It was shaped like a flattened cone, and on top was a large, brilliant red light. When I came a little closer, we could make out a row uh, or circle of white lights that ran around the entire rim of the craft. It was, I estimate, about the size of a Learjet. Like, that's fucking big. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and it was so close, if we had something to throw at it, it probably would have hit it quite easily. I sort of know the street. It's on that cul-de-sac that sort of dead ends at the East River there. I'm like, mm. how would a Learjet fit there? I know it's just semantics, but these are the questions I have. Anyway, so they call the cops, as you do when you see a UFO? Of question course. mark. I don't know. 
uh, I suppose. And uh, the, the cops actually said that other people had been calling them too. And they saw this thing, but they weren't really sure what it was. I actually got to give John and May some credit though, because they had the instinct to grab their camera. So they grabbed their Polaroid camera and took some photos, but they didn't turn out. Can you imagine if of they had? Of course they didn't. It was a UFO. Yeah, exactly. It's not going <laughs> to like be tricked into to being on film here, guys. But one thing that was funny, and I didn't, I totally forgot about this, is that John referenced the sighting on the sleeve of Walls and Bridges, which came, which came out in 1974. And he wrote in the corner, on the 23rd, August 1974, at 9 o'clock, I saw a UFO. And he signed it, JL. Yeah, and if you look at the album art inside, too, he did a lot of little drawings and right in the middle is a UFO. So he's really obsessed with it. Super committed to it, you know. <laughs> You know what? Side note, I've been watching a lot of documentaries about UFOs, and I sort of believe now. Really? Kind of. So I'm I'm on board with John. There's quite a few UFO conventions in your area. Of I'm the not world. going to a convention. I'm All not, right. What you, are you talking about? The uh, gosh, what was the thing on Facebook like last year that was like, let's storm Area 51 or something? That's in New Mexico, I think. Yeah, I know, but they were they were doing something in Vegas or around there. There's like oh, air bases okay. everywhere around here. I bet John would have gone to UFO conventions. He might have. He might have. I could have seen him becoming a huge like UFO nerd. That's a great speculation. I love yes. that. Yeah. He became a huge conspiracy theorist around like that and I don't know, Flat Earth or something. Oh God, I hope he wasn't a Flat Earther. I don't think he was in real life. But, but he could have he could have been. I mean, once you get into hardcore UFOs, sometimes Flat Earth is like right around the corner. Oh shit. Well, I'm not gonna go yeah. that far. But okay, please please don't. I won't. I won't. I'm gonna curb myself right now. Nice. Okay. So just a few other things mentioned in passing that he was living on the East Side, which is about as different a world from the West Side as you can get in New York City, even though it's only like three miles away. It's weird. It's just how it is. And um, the apartment that he lived in actually just went on the market last month. Dude. And for a cool 5.5 mil, you can live where John and May Pang lived. You need to go take a tour of that. Like, seriously, go take a freaking tour. I think I should. I think I'm willing to throw on a mask and I think you take have a to. look. And the pictures on this on the listing are just incredible. Yeah, there's the little terrace where they presumably saw the UFO. Yeah, just imagine John buck naked outside with May Peng and a UFO. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like stuff of dreams. This is a beautiful apartment though, I must say. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of character onwards because our listeners can't see it uh, what we're looking at poor them poor them i know <laughs> i just wanted to point out a few other places in john's new york city life that were important to him some of them still around today uh the hit factory on 48th street this is where john and yoko recorded double fantasy it was bought out by sears studios around 20 years ago but yoko still does some of her recording and mixing there and if you go tour it, you won't find much about John, but you will find a few tape machines from the Abbey Road recording sessions, which they just bought and just made. So mm -hmm. not as much John history there, but it's still around. Um, the, the record plant studios on 44th Street, John also recorded there. That is the place where he and Yoko were coming home from after recording their double fantasy tracks on the evening of December 8th, 1980. It's now closed. It's now closed. What the hell? I've been there. Yeah, I went to the record plant. Well, it was called something else at the time. Uh, I can't remember what, but I went there a few years ago and I got to see the studio. I got to go in the studio where John was the night he went home and perished. Oh, sadly. well, maybe it's just under another name and not closed. Just yeah, like, uh, I hit factory is your studios. It's not, yeah, it's not called, uh, yeah, it's not called record plant anymore. But yeah, um, I don't think so. I think that was the one I went into off of Times Square. Um, so yeah, no, but I it was very cool to go there, I must say, and uh, see the spaces where John recorded. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. I hope it's still around. I hope so too. I have to do some yeah. digging into that. Uh, another place that is still around, at least for now, uh, is Smith's Bar on West 44th Street. If you've seen pictures of old New York, this might have shown up. It's very large. A bar and diner, and John used to go there after recording sessions, and he loved the burgers. Uh, mm -hmm. The fate of the restaurant is actually a bit unsure in the age of Corona, but let's hope they come back. Support it. Yes. Uh, let's see. Another very famous place was for John, a very important place for John was Madison Square Garden. John rarely performed in the 70s, but MSG plays a huge role in the history of John's solo live performances. 
So the first one was August 30th, 1972. In that day, he played two benefit concerts for the Willowbrook State School, and that became the album Live in New York City. Um, the set list was pulled from a lot of his from his most recent albums, so Plastic Ono Band, Imagine the New, released sometime in New York City, and also included the song Instant Karma, Come Together, Elvis's Hound Dog, and a sing-along of Give Peace a Chance. These were John Lennon's only full-length live shows in his entire solo career. And this day, 1972, was the last time he performed live on stage with Yoko. Wow, that's kind of mind-blowing. I know. Um, I think he only performed a handful of times after the Beatles stopped touring. Yeah, I mean, not to speculate, but I do feel like if he had lived, that would be something that he might have taken up again. Do you think? I mean, he was reportedly, like, every time before he performed, he would just, like, be so sick to his stomach because he was so nervous. I could see him doing acoustic sets or doing more low-key stuff. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't think he would do, like, the, the way Paul does it. Oh yeah, no. I think I think he probably would have made fun of Paul. He might have, but he probably would have appeared on stage with him. Oh, I think once so. or twice. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I agree. Just like he did on November twenty eighth, nineteen seventy four, with Elton John. Good segue. Also at Madison Square Garden. Thank you. Which was John's last public performance. This performance actually started because of a bet. Elton had collaborated with John on the song Whatever Gets You Through the Night and Surprise, Surprise, Sweet Birds of Paradox on John's Walls and Bridges album. John had never had a solo number one record. And so he jokingly told Elton that if Whatever Gets You Through the Night goes to number one, he'd play as a guest star live with him on stage. And the rest is history. And that was John's only number one in his lifetime. So interesting to think about how small John Lennon's solo career was. Yeah. Because he took all that time off and he did a lot of experimental stuff. I mean, but just when you think about it compared to Paul, like how much we lost, you know, how much we didn't get. Oh my gosh. Yeah, totally. Well, it's also, it blows my mind that John didn't feel like whatever gets you through the night would go to number one because he, you know, it was so far fetched for him, the idea that it would, he'd be like, oh yeah, whatever, it will never happen. Yeah. But to me, when I hear it, I'm like, of course it did. Like, it's totally in the pocket of that era. It's like that disco-y sort of like danceable, um, you know, mm -hmm. totally radio friendly back then, you know, AM top 40. You know, it's like, of course, John, like have a little bit of a little bit of your finger on the pulse here. It's it, that's a good song. I mean, it's a great song. And he and Elton did it very well. Definitely. Um, so after playing the song, they did Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which Elton John had recently covered. And oddly enough, I saw her standing there. Weird. Weird. Which is a strange choice. Uh, John explained it in his intro in the concert. He said, we tried to think of a number to finish off with so I can get out of here and be sick. Like you said, <laughs> he gets sick all the time and live on stage. And we thought we'd do a number of an old estranged fiance of mine called Paul. This is one I never sang. It's an old Beale number. And we just about know it. <laughs> so, so funny. Yeah. It cracks me up. What a strange, like those are his last like three or four songs that he ever played live. And one of them was I saw her standing there. That's so crazy. Yeah. Just to think about that, it's very strange. So, so weird. Hmm. Um, this concert also marked the beginning of his reunion with Yoko after his very debaucherous 16-month-long weekend with May Pang, which uh, out of that long weekend came the smash hit, A Toot and a Snore in 74. Oh, my gosh. We have we need to dive into all of that sometime. <laughs> we do. That the smash a hit. Crazy yeah. time. <laughs> Um, so he was talking about Yoko and he said she was backstage afterwards and there was just that moment when we saw each other and like, it's like in the movies, you know, and time stands still and there was silence. Everything went silent, you know, and we were just sort of looking at each other. Hmm. That's so nice. I know. <laughs> I love that. So he began courting Yoko and dating her again. They kind of started over. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then the next year, Sean was born and John Makes left sense. music for four years to focus on his wife and son and being, as he said, a house husband. That's so, I mean, you know, obviously we don't have time to get into all of this, the semantics of it, but you go from like, yeah, his crazy, wild, debaucherous last weekend to literally a 180 of, you know, as he would say, like baking bread and, and you know, staying at home while Yoko made the money. Yeah. So funny to see how he changed 
so fast. It's such an amazing thing about John is that he was never attached to an identity. Yeah, totally. It's yeah, it's it's crazy. And maybe that's part of why he got to live so much life in his 40 years because he always explored. Yeah, he was just flexible. He's like, "Yep, this is cool." Like, all right, like I'll go I'll go to LA now and hang out with uh, Harry Nelson and get banned from the Troubadour. This sounds good. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, once you get banned from the Troubadour, where else do you have to go? That's true. Yikes. He peaked. Yeah. But anyway, um, you know, over time, John became as much of a symbol of life in New York City as he really was as a symbol of life in Liverpool. I mean, John in the 70s, he really epitomized the feeling of New York City, of the Upper West Side neighborhood where he lived and he raised Sean. I mean, people would say that he would be at local bars, that they would that he would go to Central Park with Sean. He would spend time there. Uh, he also loved Tavern on the Green, which is a hidden restaurant in Central Park. And in fact, he celebrated both his 38th and 39th birthdays there. So 41 and 42 years ago today. I had my first drink ever. Um, really? At Tavern on the Green, I think the day before my 21st birthday. Aww. Yeah, I went there with my mom, and I don't know how they didn't carve me, but yeah, it was like it was the day before my birthday. I think I had my first. I don't remember what it was. I think it may have been like an amaretto sour or you know one of those drinks that you like a Sex on the Beach or something really sweet. You know. The, yeah, That's so nice. Tavern. Yeah. Oh, maybe you sat at the same table where he celebrated that birthday, and it was also Sean's third and fourth birthday. So oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure, definitely. Yeah, my mom loved to go there too. So yeah. a lot of happy memories yeah. going to Tavern on the Green. Okay. For you and for the Ono oh Lennons. Yes. Another thing that we haven't mentioned yet is Bob Gruen's famous photo of John wearing his NYC shirt, posing mm. with the Statue of Liberty posing with a cigarette in a denim jacket. That's about as iconically NYC as you can get. Yeah. And not to mention that like now all Beatles fans try to recreate the picture of John with a Statue of Liberty. Oh yeah. I've done it. I've tried. <laughs> and how many people are like, Oh, you live in New York. Oh, can you get me one of those John NYC shirts? Um, that was the first thing I bought the very first time I went to New York. Exactly. I'm like, I need to get one of those goddamn shirts. Yeah. I don't think I still have it, but I definitely bought one. Even though it was kind of a blip in his life, those pictures were actually taken in the East Side apartment on 52nd Street that he shared with May Pang. Oh. So they, that's why you've got such nice views of the water because it was over there on the East River. Oh, makes sense. He was very influenced by New York City. And I think at this time, too, you could really hear it in his music, most notably, of course, in the song New York City that was on the album Sometime in New York City and his only live solo album that was called Live in New York City. Uh, so he was very... Yeah, he was really concentrated on it. Of course, um, the song New York City is is almost like a bookend to, John, to the ballad of John and Yoko. It's talking about places and people. And of course, Yoko, <laughs> that things. so his experience in New York City, it's a very similar song. And then the last place I want to mention is the is Strawberry Fields. So after John was murdered, a two and a half acre section of Central Park right near the Dakota building, um, right off the 72nd Street entrance to the park, was renamed Strawberry Fields and re-landscaped, and it now stands as a living memorial to John. It was actually dedicated 35 years ago today oh. on his 45th birthday. That's so nice. And at the heart of the area is the Imagine Mosaic, where visitors from all over the world come. They leave flowers. They take photos. Uh, there's almost constant Beatles music that plays year round and actually before around 2006 it was sort of like a gangy kind of thing like people would fight about who would get to play oh my god was like yeah. a lot of violence about it sort of like also in new york the ice cream man roots are a uh, like dangerous what like thing. mr softy's like fighting yeah her. like who gets which street to drive the ice cream truck down <laughs> i love all this like turf war stuff in new york it's not like you know not the serious like street gang stuff but like mr softy is gonna kick some ass because oh yeah there was a huge article in the times like five or six years ago about the mr softy turf wars <laughs> I, I love it Not even I, kidding <laughs> oh what oh my god i do remember um the yeah the t the factions at strawberry fields though like the first time i went i think i'm oh no there used to be that mayor of strawberry fields remember oh yeah uh-huh yeah he passed away i think in 2013 oh r.i.p maybe that yeah because yeah, there was a big old article about him too somewhere mm -hmm. 
Um, but I do remember, yeah, like the different, yeah, the different people who have like, they have their set days and times where they could be there. Yeah. And never the twins shall meet. Exactly. Exactly. And even now during COVID, there's lots of people still there. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to see some, some cool stuff tomorrow. Yeah, it's lovely. And it's funny, like a lot of people don't realize how big it is. Like you mentioned, it's two and a half acres because it's got all of that lovely green space around it. That's part of Strawberry Fields. Yeah, people crowd around the mosaic. I mean, not all of the landscaped area is available for people to walk on. So right. I think that's part of the reason. A lot of it is just to look at. But um, there are lots of places to walk and wander. And if you like dogs, people bring so many dogs mm. to Strawberry Fields. The other day, I took a picture of a dog in a bow tie sitting on the mosaic. <gasps> Can yeah. we post that on our? Yeah. Oh, yay! <laughs> it's really cute. Oh, I'm sad you didn't text that to me. <laughs> I know. I don't know why I did. Oh, oh I, I did see that. Yeah, it's for so science. Cute. It's so cute. Everybody oh, should see it. That's adorable. I had to zoom in a bit, so oh, I see. it might not have been a great picture, but if oh it's good gosh, enough, that's so cute. People post it. I know. There was still, like a. T- it was like taboo for a while to like walk on the mosaic. I think. Like I remember, I remember people getting yelled at for it like a few years ago, or maybe like ten years ago now. But the last time I was there, I took a photo with it, which I hardly ever do. But and I like knelt on the mosaic, and I even felt mm-hmm. a little bit bad. I was like, oh. <laughs> well, maybe they they uh, they fortified it a little bit. It seems like a lot of people do walk on it. And, yeah. But it, it's it was at least it was sinking. They didn't <gasps> build it on the sturdiest foundation. So hopefully they fix that. Oh my goodness. Hopefully. I do remember, I, I vaguely remember now them doing some renovations on it, like maybe five or six years ago, but maybe I'm making that up. I don't know. When I go tomorrow, I'll see if it looks like it's visibly sinking. Yeah. See if it's sinking. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> That's all we need, 2020, really. It's like the Imagine Mosaic just sink away. That would be the most 2020 thing Christ. that could happen, though. <laughs> um, one other tribute to John is in the same area two years ago, Yoho commissioned some artwork of blue skies with clouds with the words Imagine Peace on, a tr- on the walls of the 72nd Street subway station right near the Dakota. So you come to that area, you're pretty much inundated with uh john fields which is great it's lovely so that that is john in new york city and on his very very special landmark birthday um i'm very glad that we have both been able to live in new york city and experience this thing that john loves so much yeah definitely and you know i know it's a big pilgrimage for a lot of beatles fans i think a lo- I mean, it's it, like you said, it, he's as synonymous with New York as he is with Liverpool. I think it's right up there. A lot of, of course, fans feel drawn to go to the Dakota. Of course they do. You know, it makes sense. But it's really nice that Yoko created this beautiful, like peaceful space and way to honor John that doesn't, you know, it doesn't relate back to like what happened across the street. You know, it's yeah. like... Yeah, and the fact that Yoko continued to live at Dakota, you know, she still has the same apartment that she and John had with, you know, baby Sean, and that talks about her resilience a lot. And, you know, I think John would have still probably lived at Dakota if he were still alive. I think they considered it their home. I mean, you buy it. You buy into that place. So, yeah, they loved it. He really embraced the culture of the city and, you know, he raised his son as a city kid. Yeah, exactly. And um, New York loved John. And now, as we are wont to do at the end of our episodes, we love to talk about our latest Beatles obsession. I'll kick it off, Erica. Go first. What are you obsessed with this week? Well, I mean, it kind of fits with the theme because in my travels, my John travels, this week, I discovered a really strange video that I'd never seen before. And what it is, is it's just audio, but it is John and Paul in the studio, probably, I think it's 69, could be 68, but I think it's 69. And they're together composing a song. And the song, weirdly, is Give Me Some Truth. I mean, it really caught me off guard because it's like, I didn't know Paul had anything to do with that song. 
so but, weird. Yeah, but yeah, it, it, as you listen to it, they're going through the entire song. Like the structure's there. You know, there's the money for a rope. There's all of the different, I mean, some of the names, some of the wordplay changes, but the structure, the melody, the give me some truth refrain, everything is there. And you can hear Paul actively contributing to it. And he even advises John on like some of the chord changes and like that kind of thing. And I'm like, it's so bizarre to me. I had no idea that that song, A, was even around then and B, that Paul had anything to do with it. It's crazy how much came out of those sessions. Yeah. And it, yeah, it, it made me think too. It's like, you know, as we were talking about, like John's solo career was unfortunately not that long. And it made me think like, you know, what else in John's catalog was around in say the White Album sessions, which is when they all started sort of breaking off and writing for themselves. We know we had Child of Nature, which ended up to be Jealous Guy, but who right. knows what they threw away. Yeah. And, you know, George, certainly a lot of his songs ended up on later albums that he composed during that time. And Paul had a couple. But I, I would have never, ever thought that Paul had anything to do with Give Me Some Truth. So that, that blew my freaking mind. Yeah, especially with the subject matter of Give Me Some Truth. Oh, yeah. To have Paul involved. I know. I, I, I was saying to Erica earlier, it's like, I always thought that was about Paul. <laughs> <laughs> like there was a little Paul hate in there I thought like it was it, it fits probably the period was. yeah I mean like it, of course it'd be like John being like a petty bitch to be like Paul help me with this song oh no it's about some other jerk I hate like not about you uh-uh and now you can help me with another, another song called uh how do you sleep also not about you <laughs> like another there's like this total asshole I know but uh you know not you <laughs> That's actual audio from... And in in the meantime, off to the side, George was writing an epic three album fuck you to John and Paul. So it was just <laughs> really, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Oh my God. <laughs> I have the best image of George just like huddled in a corner, like mumbling to himself, like I fucking hate you guys. Right. Like, with his long hair and that hat, like he wears in the cover of all things. Must be I best. love it. Oh, so good. <laughs> so bitchy. Yeah. yeah. So that that is... Uh, my I, I it legit is like an obsession this week I can't stop listening to it I can't stop thinking about it and I just need to know more so if you know more about this please let us know email us like dm us something because I yeah I'm just dying to know more about this how Paul contributed to give me some truth so what Erica I want to hear about yours Okay, so this has been an obsession for a little while now, and I'm not going to go into all the details because I think we have to do an episode about this. Um, So there's this cult leader. His name is Tony (laughs) Alamo. I love it. Any sentence starts, so there's this cult leader. (laughs) Right? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, dude was full on cult leader. Like, he had, like, compounds in Arkansas. He has compound in California. He died in prison because he was marrying underage women, like, serious serious uh you know bad 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 man um and so he has a very strange tie connection to the beatles he says on his website which is alamoministries.com he says that he has an unreleased beatles album uh sure dan (laughs) Yeah, right? He also says that he was an early promoter of Pete Best's career. Mm. So this man devoted an entire page to pictures of affidavits that some random people who claim to be Pete Best's manager but have no mention in the records anywhere else say that Tony Alamo is part of this early promotion of Pete Best. He has random promotional photos of Pete Best and other people who aren't him just sitting here. So no real connection to him. He has a bunch of emails from like 2003 between him and Rogue Best, where basically Rogue is saying, hey, Tony, uh, there's a new Beatles book, but I know you asked if you're in it. You're not. (laughs) Um, You're not. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so bizarre. And the clips from the original Beatles album, like, they're not even trying. (laughs) It's just the weirdest thing. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm researching it. It's really strange. Eventually, I want to do an episode on it because there's some weird, weird shit in the Beatles community. And this might be the topper. 
well, eventually we're going to go. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. See, I found this out from this amazing podcast that I love. It's called, Oh No, Ross and Carrie. And these two skeptics, they go to crazy, like fringe science, paranormal, religious stuff. And they they go and they experience it. And then they do a podcast about what their experience was like. And they told us in this podcast that um, if you go to a certain corner in Hollywood, the Tony Alamo Ministries bus will pick you up and take you to the compound and <laughs> you can go to a service there. Like, so yeah, I mean, you know, living in LA, it's like, I would do it. I would want to come back from this compound though. And I mean, I know they did apparently because they did they the podcast. Did. They did. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we, probably should go and try to track down this uh quote unquote lost beatles album yeah i mean last time i was there we did harry potter so that's done so the next thing is definitely the cult yes and if there's anything that's operating during covid it's a cult oh yeah (laughs) oh they're not really interacting with anybody anyway so they're probably okay that is true that's sadly you're probably right about that they're in their little bubble yeah it's a small cult god well on that note Thank you for listening to Because the Beatles, the podcast, you know, that you're listening to now, wherever you find your podcasts on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and please, please give us a rating slash review so other Beatle maniacs can find us. Yes, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We'll be posting photos and more from this episode and beyond. We are at BC the Beatles everywhere. You can also email us at bcthebeatles at gmail.com. See you next time. Bye.